Ephesians in chapter one. Um, and let me again wish all the mothers, happy Mother's Day, guys. Um, thankful for all of the mothers in this room and, uh, and thankful for all that you guys do with your children and, uh, and the truths that you teach them at home. Thankful for you guys. Um, let's go ahead and read Ephesians chapter one. We have a lot to work through today. So if you can and you're able, please stand. We stand to honor the reading of God's word. Um, I'm going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 3 down through 6 this morning. When I finish reading, you'll hear me affirm this is the word of the Lord. I encourage you at that point to respond with, thanks be to God. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, hear now the word of the living God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord God, would you please bless us this morning, God, Lord, with this monumental text, God, with all the depth in this passage, Lord, may we catch a glimpse of Christ's glory. May we catch a, a glimpse, Lord, of what you have done for us, and may we turn our hearts in love to you. Lord, we ask all these things in reliance on your spirit and in the name of your son. Amen. Please be seated. There's a 95% chance we won't make it through this passage this morning. I'll explain that as we go along. We're, we're being ambitious. You guys know how this works, but my goodness, there's so much in this passage. I'll explain why we're tackling all three verses. We might slow down to a word at a time next week. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I, I was thinking about this passage, and I was thinking about how, um, how kids oftentimes will go, and I say kids. Um, I realized I used the term kiddo earlier, and, and that can sound a little bit pedantic or dismissive. Um, young people in general, right, like even teenagers, young adults, um, can go through a phase where they're trying to, like, figure out who they are. I, th I think a lot of us can kind of sympathize with that. Some of you in this room are very glad Facebook was not around when you were going through your teens and early 20s. You're all looking at... You had a pair of Jinkos like I did if you were my age. I grabbed a pair of Jinkos. Do you remember Jinkos? Those jeans? Thank you, brother. And like four people could fit inside one pants leg. And I got those for a time. And I was like, is this me? And I wore them for a few weeks and turned out it was not actually me. But like a lot of a lot of us, you know, we're growing up. We're trying to figure out like who exactly we are, how we fit in. Am I a Jinko wearing person? Clearly not. Um, but it's interesting in our day and age, our culture places a pretty huge weight and value on discovering who you are. Right? This is kind of a, a drumbeat of our time. Find out who you are. We even encourage young people to experiment with different expressions of who they think they are. Um, sometimes that's pretty harmless. My, my kids, for a while, I had one of my kids thought he was Batman for quite some time. It lasted for a few years. He was confused when Batman was on the TV. Like, that, that's not Batman. I'm Batman. Um, so, like, you know, sometimes it's harmless like that. Um, some kid might think that they're a pirate and run around with a little, little pirate eye patch. It becomes a little dangerous when we encourage that experimentation to an unhealthy level. So if my child thinks they're a pirate and I chop off their leg and give them a peg leg and send them off to sea, that would be an unhealthy encouragement of them just sort of experimenting and thinking through who they are. That's what I find truly disturbing in our day and age, that it's oftentimes neither the children nor the adults seem to know who they are. I think that's a pretty, pretty consistent theme in our culture is that neither the adults nor the children they're trying to encourage know who they are, which, which essentially is like a, the blind leading the blind, right? The adults aren't quite sure who they are, but they're somehow trying to lead them. That, that creates an identity crisis, an identity crisis on a cultural level. We can't exactly say who anybody is, and we're not quite sure who we are, and things get very muddled in the middle of all that. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that is the world, I think Christians are prone to this too. Lord willing to a lesser extent, right? Uh, but if you were just to go through and peruse, if you can find a Christian bookstore anymore, peruse your Amazon cart, right? Um, if you were to look through the, the lists of best-selling Christian books, what are they asking you quite frequently with the top sellers? They're asking you to discover who you are. Who do you feel like you are inside? Um, you tell you about you, and this is how you truly find yourself. I discover, and I look inside. This is why Christians have become very vulnerable to things like horoscopes, Enneagram tests, all those sort of things that try to give you some sort of hidden understanding of who you are. I bring all this up 
because Ephesians points to something very, very different, very different than what I just described. And in fact, it's something that is far, far better than taking some online test or reading some self-help book. Ephesians wants you to have your true identity, your true identity, to actually know who you are. That, that's not the sort of identity that can be put on like a change of clothes. This is not just trying on some Jinko jeans for the afternoon. This is not an identity that requires you to do anything to yourself. This is who you truly, truly are at the heart of it. Um, see, I think one of, the, one of the huge troubles, and it should be obvious, one of the huge troubles of trying to find yourself by yourself is that you have to look inside to do that. If it's just me figuring out me, where am I to look? Well, I look inside of myself. So I search inside myself and I find very little except for those winds and waves of emotions and feelings and life experiences. It's very topsy-turvy if I look inside of myself. I see a lot of struggle, which I think is to be expected, right? We're all going through things in our life. This is the point though. Scripture wants you to know that your identity is actually found outside of yourself. It's not found by looking deep inside. Your identity, brothers and sisters, is found looking outside of yourself to the one who made you. This is what Paul is angling toward, and we should say this is what God through Paul is angling toward in Ephesians. God tells us who we are. God tells us who we are. Your identity, in fact, Christian, is found with Christ. And if you were to truly find peace and fulfillment and enjoyment in this world, it's a joyful thing to find your identity. We find it, as we just went through in catechism with the kids, in Christ. We're going to walk through that here a little bit. But if you look at the, at the outset of this chapter, the reason we're cha tackling these verses is Paul begins here with a little bit of a doxology. If you're familiar with that term, doxology, it's just kind of like a speaking praise to God. He's speaking much about who God is and um, how great our God is before he gets into who we are. That's sort of the flow of things in Scripture quite oftentimes. And he does this in Trinitarian fashion, and this is what we're trying to tackle this morning. He speaks first here in our passage, verses 3 through 6, about our blessings from God the Father. This is sort of the kind of capstone of what we're talking about today. He's going to follow that up with two sections speaking about, again, in Trinitarian form, blessings from God the Son and blessings from God the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of like that's kind of his flow from verses 3 down through 14 if you're looking. Now, I want to point out, we, we've said this before, and in fact, somebody made a joke about it before I walked up here, but Paul does this in breathless fashion. So I'm going to ask you, as you are reading through Ephesians with us, and as you're hopefully memorizing this, especially if you have kids, I hope you're encouraging your kids to memorize uh, portions of Ephesians, you have to hold your breath while you do this. Paul is doing this without breathing. There's, no, there's, not, any, uh, there's not any breaks here. This is one long sentence, verses 3 down through 14. Any punctuation you have there has been, tr has been supplied to help you to not have a migraine as you're trying to keep up with Paul. That is why you have the period, thank your translators for that one. But, but this reminds us of a really important truth. Paul does this not because he's really bad at writing, okay? Paul was not just like some, some you know, ignorant hick that didn't know how to compose a sentence. Paul knows all this stuff fits together. And again, we should back up a little bit and say, God wants us to know through Paul's writing, all this fits together. It's almost as if he can't stop talking as he's talking about your blessings from the Father and your blessings from the Son and your blessings from the Spirit because it's all one huge thought that's tying together. So let's jump on into our text. Let's look at verse 3 first. Three things to look at this morning. The first is a praise that we are blessed in Christ. A praise that we are blessed in Christ. Let's look at verse 3 one more time. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has, speaking of the Father, blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? What does Paul mean by blessed here? So we hail from the South, and if you're from the South, you'll hear the word blessed uh, quite frequently. In fact, I think it's made its way into Michigan as well. I've heard it from people here in Michigan as well, but in the South, it's, like, it's almost like breathing. You're just like, well, blessed, you know, and I'm blessed, and you be blessed and blessed. I got into an argument with a Taco Bell attendant one time. <laughs> oh, it, long story, but anyway, she wanted my friend to be able to bless me by paying for my meal, and we had a straight-up theological argument. But it's just very, like, it's just common parlance, right? It's just one of those things you say. It's like going to Canada and saying, you know, oh, or sorry, or something like that. I just lost all of our Canadian friends. But, um, but being blessed, actually blessed, this is a really important biblical theme. This is like a drumbeat, especially here in Scripture. Again, Paul's not just making up words. This is really important that we think of ourselves as blessed. He repeats it five times in this short little passage. Five times. Blessed. Blessed in God the Father. 
So what sort of blessings are we given? Well, he says you are blessed, and he mentions the heavenly places there in verse 3. The heavenly places. There's so much depth to this passage, but just consider for a moment what Paul is angling at here. What do we know of the heavenly places? Well, we know that Christ has been raised to the heavenly places. In fact, if you're reading ahead, and I encourage you once again, this is my third plug this morning if you're keeping track, read ahead in Ephesians with me, you'll see that toward the end of Paul's breathless sentence that we're getting through, he's going to speak about Christ having been raised. By the time you get down to verses 20 and 21, in fact, he'll speak of Christ being raised into the heavenly places. Um, in our catechism time with the kids, in 28 weeks, we will get to that place as well. Question 28 talks about Christ having been raised and seated in the heavenly places. I thought it was fortuitous that this came up uh, this week as well, because many of you saw some posts on Thursday. Thursday is generally recognized as Ascension Day. It's the day when the church celebrates that Christ has not only raised from the grave, which is, which is miraculous uh, that he was resurrected, but also that he ascended. Not just coming to life, but ascending on high to be seated at the right hand of the Father. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge thing for us to celebrate. But I thought it was worth pointing out here. What it's not saying is that Christ is somehow now done with the things in this earth. When we celebrate that Christ has ascended, when we talk about blessings in the heavenly places, sometimes Christians can hear that and we get the sense of like, oh, this is something that doesn't actually touch down here. It's something far away, far removed. We shouldn't actually expect to see anything here in this world. I would just say what Paul's angling at in Ephesians is far, far from that. Far, far and away from Christ somehow removing himself from what he began here. If, if you were to think of the way Christ encouraged us to pray, for example, how did he encourage us to pray before he ascended? He said, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Christ is very concerned with the things in this world. His ascension does not remove him as if he is, he is somehow less present with us. Um, one, one of the promises of Christ that we often cling to is that he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will be with you even to the end of the age. These are the promises that Christ gives his church. His ascension doesn't remove him away from us. So if it's not a removal, you might be wondering to yourself, what, what, what's Christ's ascension about then? Why is Paul bringing it up so early here, speaking of blessings in the heavenly places? What's this all about? This is the best way to think about this, I think. This is a coronation ceremony. Um, this is not in my notes, by the way, but some of you in this room are very, uh, are, are very captivated by, uh, by the monarchy and the celebrations from England um, when they crowned... Who was the king they just crowned? See, all of you knew the name. We fought a war to not care who they crowned as king in England. We'll talk about that later. But yeah, so like there, but there's a fascination with this, right? There's pomp. There's circumstance. It's a beautiful thing, right? All, all the pageantry and all the meaning behind this, that's a coronation ceremony, right? They're crowning a king. They're recognizing the one who is reigning. There's, there's circumstance. He's wearing his royal robes. He's seated on his royal throne. The crown is placed on his head. There's a reason we're still captivated by that. It's a magnificent display. This is what's going on here, but at a cosmic level. No earthly king being coronated but the king of kings, the Lord of lords. This is Christ's coronation, and it's about uh, establishing and recognizing his power and authority over the king's kingdom. Christ is seated on high. He has ascended on high, and he is crowned as king. This is what Paul's angling at here. We have a heavenly king. Why? Because he gets to reign over the kingdom. Where is the kingdom? It's in heaven and on earth, and it is expanding in this world. This, this is why we celebrate Christ's ascension, that the incarnate son the second person of our triune God, the Son of God who took on flesh on our behalf, has ascended bodily in the flesh into the heavens because that is where his kingly throne awaited him. And when he ascended, all of the heavenly choir just erupts in praise, and he is seated in glory at the right hand of the Father. This is what I think is in the background of Paul's mind when he gives you this little phrase in Ephesians and says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I keep, I keep repeating that because we read that and we think, well, that's neat. We've got heavenly gifts. Paul's giving you something there that's supposed to take your breath away a little bit. This is supposed to be like a staggering sentence. This is telling us that for those who are Christians, for those who are united to Christ, not because of ourselves, but because he has called a people to himself, we are given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let that wash over you for a minute. 
I, I vividly remember we had a men's group, and it was like this, this earth-shattering uh, realization for a couple of the guys. They were like, well, every spiritual blessing? All of them in the heavenly places? Let the weight of that come over you for a minute. And if you're looking for a way to make this a bit practical, because that can sound quite large, union with Christ, all the blessings therein, consider your life as I consider my life. Just consider the struggles you've had this week, maybe conflict at work, um, maybe troubles within the home, maybe just those, those frequent sins that Paul says so easily beset us, those things that are constantly cropping up in our life, and the sneaking suspicion, brothers and sisters, that you and I both struggle with, that those things just simply don't change. This is just the way things are. I'm, I'm deep in some sin. My family seems to be a mess at times. I don't much like my job, and I have conflict with everybody I come into contact with. Whatever that looks like, we are tempted daily to assume this is just sort of the way things are. This is just sort of the, the, my lot in life. We still have a hope, but typically our hope is very future, isn't it? We think of those things and we say, yes, all this is a mess, but Christ is returning one day. Whether he comes or whether I die and he comes at some point in the future, I have a hope, but it's essentially not in this life. It's only some sort of future hope, which is true because that's glorious. Christ is going to return and he is going to right every wrong and wipe every tear from every eye. Yes and amen. But the trap we fall into is thinking that's all we have to look forward to in this life essentially is something future. What I'm suggesting is what if there is more to now than we give God credit for? What if there's more to now than we reckon with from Scripture? And I'm not trying to make some sort of triumphalist, you're going to have no pain in this life. You and I both know that's not the case. But what I am suggesting is, what if there's mountaintops to the Christian life in this world with Almighty God dwelling within you, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that we simply don't grasp? And we certainly don't give God credit for at work in our lives. Every shrug of mine that says things will always be this way for me is a denial that I've been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. There's a bit more power behind that than I think that we often consider. And Paul, if you'll think to him, assuring these Christians in this letter, consider what Paul assures them with. He says, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. If you were to make a list, what might some of those blessings be? Don't shout it out loud. <laughs> um, but like, what, what might some of those blessings be? What are the blessings of heaven that we're to experience even now in this world? I started jotting down a few, and I, I purposefully did not like do research on this because I'm sure it would take us a while. You have union with Christ. Paul's already mentioned that. You have adoption as sons and daughters of God the Father. You have kinship with the rest of God's people his covenant family. You have redemption of your soul. You have freedom from sin and death. You have the blessings of the kingdom of God at work in this world. You, believer, are given eternal life now and forevermore. All of those blessings now that carry on into eternity. Blessed with every spiritual blessing is the way Paul gives it in shorthand. And where do we experience those blessings you experience those blessings through the church. Because Paul's angling at something here even more grand than our personal salvation. As glorious as that is, and as much as he talks about that in Ephesians, he's angling at saying something a bit bigger. He's saying that through the church, God is making in us, as his gathered people, a new creation. Individually and corporately, the kingdom of God, he says, is expanding in this world. And when the kingdom expands, you experience the blessings of heaven through the kingdom. Is that how you would describe church? Honestly, because this is what Paul is telling us it looks like. Nothing short of God's kingdom expanding in this world. So Paul speaks of Jesus in the next chapter, and he speaks of him being seated in the heavenly places. And he even says that we are seated with him which is going to be a big one that we're going to walk through when we get there. But I think the message that Paul is trying to communicate to us here early on in Ephesians, because again, we're just starting off in this letter, he wants us to know you're not just called to struggle through this life until death takes you away. That's not the call of the Christian. Will there be struggles? Yes. Jesus, in fact, promises us there will be. Will there be trials and tribulations? You can bet you. For some of us, more so than others, but always some of those things, right? But God wants you to know you're experiencing Christ's kingdom and all the blessings of it expanding to the furthest corners of the world. Um, I, I think I'm pushing in so hard on this one because last week I mentioned that we often struggle with peace. 
right? And maybe I'm the only one that's struggling with that, but I, I suspect many of us in this room could say, yeah, I struggle with peace in my life sometimes. Trusting where I'm at, what I'm doing, the struggles I'm having, why these things occur, any number of factors that could impinge on you and give you a lack of peace. And again, I think we lose peace because we forget what story we're in. We truly lose sight of what sort of story we're in. We're not in a story where God came and did something wonderful through Jesus Christ, but then Christ ran off into heaven and left us quite to ourselves in this world. That's far from the truth of what we're getting at the beginning of this. Instead, we're given here that we serve a God who has blessed us in Christ with all of the blessings of heaven, has called us to fight and contend against darkness wherever it may be until such a time as Christ returns and the glory of the Lord covers the world as the waters cover the sea. Whether you think so or not, that's the story you're in. And that's what gives you peace amidst the trials and tribulations. I also want to point, in, point, uh, point out uh, this before we move on. This message is for everyone. Everyone within the church, from our most mature Christians all the way down to our little ones. Um, I, I've been thinking through for next Sunday, by the way, how to make the message really uh, a little bit more bottom shelf for those who are younger uh, among us, for some of the kids that will be coming in for the integrated worship. We'll see how well that goes. Next week's passage looks even more daunting than this week's passage. Um, but I want to, again, reiterate, we've been speaking much about keeping our children integrated uh, in the main worship service on Communion Sundays. And there's a lot of reasons I think we should do this that we've been walking through. Uh, among, among those reasons is I think we see this patterned again and again in Scripture. But I want to point out, this is another place we see that, even here in Ephesians. And let me walk you through it. And what I want to emphasize is, if you are a kid in here today, let me get, get down on my knees to any of the young ones in here, this message is for you. This message is for you from Paul, from God, through the Apostle Paul. Paul opened the letter, if you noticed last week, by addressing, he said, the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. You can find that back in the first verse. This is who he's addressing. And if you've been keeping up through Ezra and Nehemiah, that word for saints, it's the same word we get from holy. It's hagias, holy ones, set apart ones. We're all very familiar with that from Ezra and Nehemiah. It's referring to the people of God, those families that God has set apart unto himself. Paul here is going to clar clarify as we go through this letter who those set apart ones are. Who is he talking to? Who is he trying to encourage with these words from God? He's talking to, as he's going to get out once he gets into the part where he's directly addressing those whom he's, to whom he's writing, talks much of God for the first three chapters, starts pushing in in chapters 4 through 6. In chapter 5, he's going to address fathers and mothers. Happy Mother's Day, guys. Fathers and mothers, right? In chapter 5, chapter 6, he's going to be speaking directly to the children as well. This message is for you if you are a child in this church. So I'm just going to ask you, kids, keep your ears open. Keep your ears open as we walk through this, because this letter is addressed to you, and you're an important part of this church. Second thing this morning, a praise that we are chosen in Christ. Let's look at verse 4. Praise that we are chosen in Christ. Verse 4, he says, Even as he chose us in him, <clears throat> excuse me, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So I, I find this really fun because Paul is not timid. Um, Paul is not shy of big words. Paul is not shy of deep concepts. Paul wants you to really get what God is up to and where you stand in all of that. And he walks through in pretty quick fashion a few doctrines that are really hard for Christians, especially in our day. Um, and I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go through this without like unnecessary apologetics or anything like that. We're just going to walk through this a little bit. If you got questions. Um, love to talk to you. But you can see here, in pretty short form, Paul mentions things like election, predestination, and adoption in pretty short order. Throws it out there as if you should be pretty familiar with this, and then he keeps on moving through. And I was wondering as I was reading this, why would such heavy concepts, such, such deep biblical concepts be included at the very front end of a letter? Um, you know, Paul's not walking us gently into things with some stories about his childhood and then getting into the meat of the matter. He just, he just kind of presents it up front. Well, I think there's a few, a few things that we could look at from this, why this is included at the front end. The first thing I would suggest is that these, these concepts of, again, election, predestination, adoption in Christ, these aren't theological speculations. This isn't something that some guys cooked up, you know, when they were bored in an ivory tower one day. These are simply foundational biblical truths. 
This is, this is building blocks of Christian doctrine. God elects and he predestines of his own will, and we find that attested all throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament. It doesn't mean it's not a heavy concept and a heady thing to think through, but it does mean it's thoroughly biblical that God does so. But second, Paul mentions these because he's worshiping. I hope that sounds weird. Paul mentions these heavy doctrinal concepts because he's worshiping. I don't want you to lose track of what Paul's doing here. Paul's not setting out a systematic theology, although it kind of comes across that at times, right? Ephesians has these, these big pillar posts in it. Paul is erupting in praise so much, though, that he is breathless for a few chapters. Paul is worshiping God. He is overflowing with praise for here what God the Father has done on our behalf and in the course of that praise to God, Paul includes specifically the work that the Father does in election and predestination. It's a form of him praising what God has done. I thought that was fascinating as I was working through this because just to, just to be real, real uh, transparent here, it's sad, honestly sad, that so many Christians discuss these concepts and it leads us to what? Not worship, right? What does it lead to? It leads to arguments. It leads to fights. Um, it leads to knotted stomachs and headaches. It leads to division and disunity in the worst cases. I think all of those things are the polar opposite of what Paul is presenting these things for. Th these concepts, when we think of God electing and predestining a people to himself, they're supposed to lead us to worship because it's about God. Paul's telling you what God has done in all of his wisdom and mercy. God is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. Psalm 115.3 and here we're told a little bit of a glimpse of some of those things that God has done on our behalf, a little glimpse into the, the handiwork of heaven, so to speak. And I mentioned that Paul is worshiping because, brothers and sisters, when we are given a glimpse into heaven, what should that lead the believer to? Praise. Confusion at times, sure, I get it. Scripture, we work through these things, but this leads us to praise. Praise God that he has done these things on our behalf. So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, need to, I need to mention the words that he uses. So Paul mentions that God has chosen us. Okay, Chosen us is just another way of saying that he has elected us. And he says that God has done this from the foundation of the world, God the Father. The Father chose us before there was anything made that has been made. And he predestined to save a people unto himself. Predestined just means he determined beforehand. He set his mind to do something and he accomplishes everything he sets his mind to. And it says he chose to do all these things, how? In Christ. From the foundation of the world, before anything was made, the Father and the Son predestined that the Son would come to live, to die, and to rise, and to ascend, and to call a people unto himself. Christ is our covenant head. This is, this is from the foundation of the world. Again, this is, those, this is those holy moments in which we just say, praise God for what he has done from eternity past on our behalf. Um, there, there's a lot of things in Ephesians. I mentioned sort of pillar posts. There's a lot of things in Ephesians that are sort of worked through in more detail elsewhere. Um, this is a really good example. Paul's building on things that he, he susses out in much greater detail in other, uh, other parts of the Bible, um, other letters that he's written, rather. But Paul speaks a lot about this in the letter to the Romans, um, specifically in Romans chapter 8. And I just wanted to point this out because this, this kind of pairs quite well with what we're walking through here in Ephesians chapter 1. So in Romans chapter 8, it's often called the golden chain of redemption because it's showing you from eternity past to eternity future, like little links in a chain, what has God done for a people. And Paul walks us through, by the way, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the bold, and I think it's blue, yeah, so the bolding is not in your text. Let me make that clear. Paul just wrote it normal, but I've blown it up a little bit just to show you the words we're trying to key in on. But the, consider what Paul said elsewhere here in Romans chapter 8. He said, for those whom he, speaking of God, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You hear the brothers language again? We're going to get back to that in a minute. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's speaking of your, your future glorification. And then he says, what then shall we say to these things? What do we say to this, this massive truth? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
Do you hear the same themes there? All things giving to us. Who shall bring any charge against God? It is God who justifies. Same theme as he's doing here, and it's a consistent group that's in mind. Those whom are foreknown are predestined. That same group is then called, then justified, and then even glorified. Paul, Paul's showing us an amazing truth here. In the mind of God, what he sets out to do in eternity past is as good as done in eternity future. God's plans come through. And this is why he can assure us that we are as good as glorified. That's to say we are as good as resurrected and standing with God in eternity future. Why? Because what God sets in motion will not be stopped. God does not fail and he does not falter. God's plans will come true. I'm going to throw this in here at the risk of souring the whole thing. But brothers and sisters, um, I know the word Calvinism is thrown around quite a bit. I happen to like John Calvin, but we're not appealing to John Calvin. If John Calvin is right, it's because he looks to what's in Scripture. What we're talking about here is not Calvinism. We're talking about biblical Christianity. God does all that he pleases in heaven and on earth, and none will sway his hand. So further, we're told that this is meant to lead to something. Do you see the progression there? He's, he's telling us who we are. He's telling us who God is and what he's done, and that's supposed to lead us to something. Here he says that we should be holy and blameless before him. In other words, Paul says we're chosen in Christ. Why? That we will be found holy and blameless before him. There's a result. God does these things with a purpose in mind. There's a goal in mind to which he is leading us. But there's a little bit of a, a, a dynamic here that I think is worth pointing out. Are you holy and blameless before Christ, or excuse me, before God the Father on, because of what Christ has done? The answer has to be yes. You stand, Christian, justified before God. And yet, is there a point in the future at which we will be justified? We will stand holy and blameless before him. Yes. Both of those dynamics are in play here. And this is an example of what do we mean when we talk about all the spiritual blessings of God in the heavenly places. It means you stand right now as good as justified before the throne. And yet one day we will stand justified and faultless before the, the, the throne. It's something that progressively God works out. Paul, I mentioned that at the front end because Paul's going to hit this pretty hard in chapter 4. And I want you to be thinking in those terms. Paul wants you to know you stand right now in Christ. But that's something that's leading somewhere. Inevitably and unstoppably, it's leading to our glorification. I, I mentioned chapter 4 because by the time we get to chapter 4, Paul's going to do something that Christians really chafe against. He's going to tell us all these great truths that make for good Sunday school lessons, and he's going to do this really uncomfortable thing where he says, your lives should look a little different. I say that tongue-in-cheek, right? Th th those are always the things we struggle with. God is good. God is great. God has done all these things. We're like, yes, chapter 4 hits. Now you, Christian, live in such a way, and then we're like, whoa. You know, like, but yeah, pump the brakes a little bit on that. Paul wants you to know from the very front end of this letter, who you are leads to how we live. Who you are in Christ, brothers and sisters, will lead to your living differently. And I think that should go a really long way in our Christian culture. Because oftentimes as Christians, I think we live like we're convicts that had our sentence commuted. The judge decided to be merciful and he said, you're not going to the gallows and lets us out. So we're now let out of the prison, but there's nothing for us. We may endeavor to rob a little bit less. We may commit a few less crimes. We're grateful the judge let us off. But essentially, we're just kind of tossed out to the wind with our sentence commuted. That's not the picture here. Here, he actually calls you to live holy lives. Live as, those for, uh, live as, as, as if you belong to the God who has saved you. Live as if you belong to the King who has had mercy on you. We're going to get to that a little bit later, but that's literally the call of Christian living. Live as if you belong to the one who has given you all these things. Third thing this morning, we've got to wrap this one up. The third thing this morning, it leads us to praise that we are adopted in Christ. Much of this is speaking about Christ, but again, this section is still thinking of what has the Father done on our behalf? Well, here Paul says there is, we should erupt in praise because we're adopted in Christ. Let's look at verse 5 through 6, and I'm going to start, obviously, uh, if you're looking in your text, two words before chapter, or verse 5. It says, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
So I, I mentioned verse five, and I don't, I don't mean to like just be dismissive there. You'll, you'll notice the verse division is a little weird there, right? You've got in love back in verse four, and then verse five kind of is like, you know, right there. You see that in the text? It kind of like starts halfway through. There, there's, a reason, um, there's a reason that fits like that. It's a, it's a bit difficult in the Greek to really dice these sentences up sometimes. Um, because again, Paul, just to give you a glimpse into the Greek, by the way, Paul has this huge sentence and then he piles up about 18 verbs at the end of it. Greek's weird like that, but it's really hard to make these neat divisions in there sometimes. So there's different ways to read this. If you have like the NASB or maybe the NIV, yours might read a little bit different. But I think that the best way to read this is the way it's here in the ESV. In love he predestined us. Connecting that in love to him predestining us. In love he predestined us. It fits the flow of the, the, the chapter quite nicely, but just consider what, what this is saying. It's saying that God's predestination is an act of love. If you've encountered God's predestination in Scripture and you find it cold, calculating, mechanical, let me plead with you. That's not the biblical reaction to predestination because predestination, God says, is done in love. And think about the statement that's making about God, that God would look... Knowing everything, he would look at a world that he would create. He saw from eternity past that those who would bear his image would reject him and would worship idols made out of gold and straw and hay. He saw that they, we would love our sin and that we would even hate our Lord. We would hate the prophets he sent to us. We would even kill them and finally kill even his own son. We would reject and kill the Savior that God would send on our behalf, that we would be hopeless and helpless without his help. God knew it was going to happen this way from eternity past before anything was spoken into motion. And yet it says here, in love, he predestined to save a people to himself. Do you get how much that means? That knowing everything and all of the heinousness, God in love predestined to save a people. I, th I think this is why Paul never seems to get over that part. I don't think he ever, throughout the whole New Testament, to his dying breath, got over the fact of the breadth and depth of God's love and his grace, that although there is not a creature on this planet that deserves to draw breath because of our sins against our Creator, that God, before the world was created, set his intentions in love to call a people to himself. Paul never got over that. Th th my prayer is that we would never get over that. That we would never come to a passage like this and lack the depth of God's mercy and grace upon us. That he would save me and us as a people. And this is why we can be called, according to Paul here, adopted. So every Christmas, there's a song that plays, which by the how, how long is Christmas? Anybody got a countdown going? It's coming soon. Praise the Lord. Get ready, guys. So every Christmas, though, there's this popular little jingle, which we won't be singing in church, but it, it says, Santa Claus knows, well, you can obviously tell why we wouldn't sing it in church, but uh, Santa Claus knows we're all God's children, right? You guys know that little jingle. Some of you are humming it in your head. You're welcome. Um, but that's not true. Everyone is not God's children, because what Paul is telling us here is that Christians are truly the children of God. Christians are the children of God. That, that's a promise that God makes to the church, not to others. Consider what he said in, in Romans chapter 8 again. He said, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It's a blessing. It, it's a privileged status. And when I say privileged, I don't mean something we've done. I mean privileged as in praise God that he has counted us as sons and daughters. I, I was thinking about this when I was doing sermon prep, and I saw this tragic news story about a celebrity uh, who I remember, you know, seeing them in movies growing up. But they walked away from the church um, and away from the faith of their parents. It was one of those, like, really tragic stories, raised in what seemed like a godly home, firmly turned their, their back on what came before. And unsurprisingly, the reason for turning away was not because they didn't believe or not because they were challenged by something. It was because they didn't like what the Bible had to say about sexual ethics. This is so oftentimes a, a snare and a trap for those in our time. And it was this tragic story as I was reading it, but I think it also exemplifies our obsession with our own choice in these matters. We have a real desire to think much about our own choice, that we get to decide what is right and wrong, that we get to decide what is truth, that we get to decide who we are as we started this whole sermon with, that our choice in these matters is what is truly most important. And I want to point this out. Ephesians, 
God writing through Paul to the Ephesians and to us is drawing us to something far, far different. It's saying the most important and comforting and liberating and life-giving thing is not your choice nor mine, but that God chose us. That God chose us. Because he said here, Christians have been adopted. Um, our, our church has a heartbeat of adoption, foster care. Um, for a church of our size, especially, we have, I think, an outsized uh, care for those in the adoptive and fostering communities, for those in, in, a, in, in a pro-life ministry such as alternatives. Um, we, we do a lot of those things. We have many adoptive and foster parents within our church. But what every adoption depends on is not the decision of the child. What does it depend on? It depends on the choice of the father, the choice of the father. A father, usually with mother, but the father has to seek out a child who has no family, who has no claim on kinship to the, to the father. The father has to seek, seek them out to make arrangements on their own, to include them as part of their family. Adoption brings wonderful benefits to the child. They're given a family. They're brought within a fold. They're counted as one of the family, not as some separate you know, interloper, but as truly part of that family unit. But it is wholly the work of the Father. It's the same thing that we're reading in Ephesians. And I bring this up because we struggle with a lot of struggles in this world. I brought that up earlier. Many of you are working through many variety of different things, many different struggles, a lack of joy, a lack of peace, discouragement in this world. Paul and every Christian since he wrote these words by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit gained joy, joy in a prison cell, joy under home arrest, joy under persecution, and even, even uh, death. Paul found joy that he had been adopted by the Father, that God the Father had so loved him that he had adopted him into his family. Why would the Father do such things? Why would God the Father, having, having everything and needing nothing, why would he choose to adopt a people to himself? Not even a pretty people. A people that had sinned against him. A people that had ran far from him. A people that had killed his prophets and even his son. Why would he seek to adopt a people unto himself? We get this glorious little phrase here that tells us why. Paul says in pretty short form, he does these things according to the purpose of his will. He did it, in other words, because he wanted to. God the Father, in eternity past, if you ever have one of those sleepless nights and you're pondering all the great mysteries of life and you're sitting up in your bed and you think, hmm, why did God save me? Because he desired to. From the foundation of the world, God set his affection on you. And this is, by the way, what separates the Christian faith, the true faith of the living God from every false faith from every heretical cult, from every false belief in this world, is that every other false belief tells you, you can. And the message of the gospel is, God has. Everything else tells you how to earn steps and climb a ladder. And what scripture boldly and beautifully proclaims is that when you were enemies of the king, he set his affections on you and adopted you as sons and daughters. Why? Because of his glorious grace and his impenetrable will. God wanted to. Praise God, and this is why Paul never gets over the love that God pours out. He makes it clear elsewhere in one of the most unpopular chapters in the Bible. In Romans chapter 9, he said this in verse 16. He said, so then it depends on what? Not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. The testimony of every Christian that can sing into eternity of the grace of God is simple. God has. That is your testimony, believer. God has. Why is this so foundational? And this is where we'll have to wrap it up for today. Why is this so foundational to Christian living? Why would Paul, writing to beleaguered Christians in the early church with all the persecutions they would endure and all the societal press on them, pagan temples in the background casting a shadow over their church service. Why is this an encouragement to the Ephesians and every believer, every church since that time? Why is this so foundational for this magisterial letter that he writes here in Ephesians? Why is this something that leads to us giving praise and glory to the work of the Father? It's pretty simple, I think, because this is all of God. From the very start to the very finish, 
your faith in Christ, your love for God, your redemption from under your sins, your being counted as children of our Almighty God, your perseverance, praise God, to the very end. All of that is wholly a work of God. This is what Paul wants you to grab hold of, is that with the challenges of this life, with the challenges even of our sin, before we can get into all of the meat of what Ephesians will proclaim, there's a foundational truth we have to get anchored with and wrap our hearts around at the very outset. That is that God has done something for us, and everything that follows is a gift of His grace. Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we could sing and praise and read and think into all of eternity and not wrap our heads around the depth of your love and grace and mercy. God, we are so grateful to begin this letter to the Ephesians, Lord, and all of the riches that we will be encouraged by, be built by. All of this flows from who you are and what you have done. And Father, we thank you this morning that from eternity past, Lord, in your kindness and your wisdom and your grace and your mercy, that you set your affections on a people. That you chose, Lord, to save a people unto yourself, to call us through Jesus Christ our Lord and to walk with us into eternity as sons and daughters of the King. God, Lord, there's no, there's no way to utter a sufficient thanks for the gift that we have in this passage. Lord, I suppose my prayer for us as a church, God, is that we would never treat lightly things that are of such weight. Lord, I pray that we would never take for granted what can never be taken for granted. God, I pray that we would never read this passage without a tear behind our eye in thanks and love for what you have done for us. God, we are of all people to be a joyful, thankful, hopeful people that we are counted as sons and daughters of the Almighty King. God, would you lead us to an overflowing love for you in what you have done, and would you ground us, God, anchor us, give us a firm foundation with our eyes set on you. Lord, we ask all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen.